And I can't remember the guy's name right now, but he's the guy who wrote Kentucky Rain for Elvis. Yeah, I mean, just wild. Only in Nashville. Only in Nashville. See, there used to be a shell station down here, and, and this guy used to be a songwriter. He used to write for uh, Webb Pierce. His name was Les Acton. Really? Yeah, and Les had the, the coolest place. But it, he just, you know, had, had a filling station. That was it. And well, you know, those hits don't play like the pay like the. Become a WBSM Facebook fan. Log on to WBSM.com, keyword Facebook. All about cars with Ralph Medeiros, every Saturday from 10 till noon on AM 1420 WBSM. A Cushnet, Fairhaven, New Bedford. We've got you covered. AM 1420 WBSM. AM 1420 WBSM with a brand new show every other Wednesday from 1 till 2. It's the MIH Radio Show with hosts Jeremiah and Franchise. Interesting guests, local events and happenings, the arts, social media, and more. The MIH Radio Show is sponsored in part by Advanced Eye Centers. Advanced Eye Centers, focused on your results. The MIH Radio Show, every other Wednesday afternoon at 1 on AM 1420 WBSM. And now the bonus round. If absence makes the heart grow fonder, what does presence make? I want to say crab dip. Correct. Finish this sequence. Tree, sky. Transubstantiationalism. Correct. <laughs> what can you watch instantly with Netflix? Unlimited TV episodes and movies. Correct. Watch unlimited TV episodes and movies for only eight bucks a month from Netflix. See terms of use. <laughs> Ma'am, ma are you crying? I cry when I'm happy. Well, that makes two of us. AM 1420 WBSM presents Spooky South Coast with your hosts Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. All right, welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with science advisor Matt Moniz because uh, science adv uh, silent assassin Matt Costa is still on his way into the studio. He works now Saturday nights. So this is uh, we're going to have to fly by the seat of our pants without him. I think we can handle it. I think, I think so. We've done it before. So there, I mean, I got us on the air. That's something. Uh, yeah, not bad, not bad. I can't guarantee that the computer's not going to start firing off on its own, but I think I've got it under control. If not, I think I can certainly fake my way through it. Yep. Welcome to the show where we talk about the paranormal each and every Saturday night. We broadcast live here on WBSM and also on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. If you check that out, we've got a little bit of a different camera angle than we usually have because uh, we've reconfigured the way that we're seating, sitting. Usually I'm standing, so yeah. sitting is different for me, but... It's hard to do this job standing up, but uh, here I am behind the boards, which is good because I was talking to Ken Pittman, the afternoon host here on WBSM, and he was talking about me filling in for him, so i got to get all this stuff down. Yep, uh, and you're doing actually pretty good. I We're on the air. I don't want all the powers that be here at the station to know this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> when they asked me if I wanted to do the show, oh, almost six years ago, I uh, actually more than six years ago because uh, we started talking in uh, November of uh, 2000. Five. Yeah. So uh, when we talked about it, I said, oh, yeah, I can learn all that stuff. And then I said to Matt Costa, hey, you want to do a radio show and learn all that <laughs> stuff? 
and he went to school for it, and he learned all the. He came here and he trained, and then he went to school to learn broadcasting. So, you know, he's he's the guy who gets it all done. I'm just the guy that fudges my way through it. Moniz, you've you've taken some turns behind here as well. So. Yeah. It's uh, it's definitely different. It's a lot more responsibility. I, you know, there was that one show when I don't remember what happened, but uh, somehow you weren't here and Matt Costa wasn't here, and I I don't even remember what the cir- circumstances <laughs> were, but I was here, and uh, I was here by myself, and it happened. I mean, there's there's recorded evidence that it happened. And you did very well without us. Thank you. And the station was still standing Monday morning, so that was a bonus. But uh, we're going to talk about some interesting things tonight. Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about, probably a predominant part of the conversation tonight, is last week there were some local UFO sightings here on the South Coast. Yep. And not only were they sightings that were seen by a number of people, but some of the people that saw them, and I'm not saying you know that an eyewitness testimony isn't credible one way or another, but these people have a lot to lose if they were making up false reports. We have some people who I guess the skeptics would consider to be quote-unquote credible witnesses. And that's something I'm sure Moniz, as somebody who's investigated UFO cases for for many years, that must be something that you encounter a lot when you go up against some of these skeptical people is what makes a credible witness. Well, yeah, it's kind of like a double standard. You know, say a person that's just nothing against this if you pump gas for a living but you know what makes them you know less credible you know to report a ufo versus saying being able to re- report them in a, somebody in a murder you know they're good enough to put somebody to death in some cases in some states but you know they're not credible enough to witness something in the sky that's unexplained yeah i, I don't understand what it is that makes someone be considered not credible when they have one of these sightings because they saw unexplained lights in the sky. Mm. When somebody is coming here and telling me, well, it's a, it's a, I saw an aircraft, it's an aircraft unknown to man, and it's nothing like we have on this planet, and you know, it definitely couldn't have been from this earth, you know, then I might say, okay, well, what makes you credible to say that? You know, the, the common person, such as myself, might not understand you know, aviation, might not understand why some of these things look different than what we see commercially flying over the skies. Someone like you, who has both uh, investigated UFO cases and had reason to look into what type of military craft there might right. be, some of this cutting-edge stuff, but also somebody who's just kind of a buff when it comes to that kind of stuff anyway. You know, that's just one of your areas of interest. So for you to, you know, know the difference about that as opposed to a guy like me, but when you're telling me that you're seeing just unexplained lights and you don't know what they are, and I'm not finding a reason... That's what gets my interest. You know, it, it's it light, lights in the sky. We so often we can just dismiss them. How, how many times have I seen them and I've oh, called yeah. you and you've explained to me exactly what it is? So that that doesn't really, you know, it, it, that, that kind of really doesn't get my juices flowing as much as it used to. But when you have no explanation coming out and when we have both a radio broadcaster and a newspaper editor who saw these lights. These are both people who are going to be able to get in touch with authorities to find out what these they are. These are people that do due diligence, yes. And But they're, but even if I try to do due diligence, well, I guess I'm a little bit different because I'm a reporter, but if the, the common person tries to, get do, tries to do their due diligence and contacts you know, certain organizations, they might hit a brick wall. You know, they might say, uh, you know, we, we, we can't tell you. you know, they, they might even just outright deny that there was something in the area. But... If you're calling from a news organization, then they might give you the old runaround of, well, there was something in the sky, it was ours, but we can't tell you what it was. You know, there's which actually happens very rarely. Sure. Uh, and but uh, the most most of the time when you go looking into these, say you're calling into uh, air airports and FAA offices and stuff like that, the general runaround you get is. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, you'll have to ask another agency, and then you start going the round robin. Go talk to military. Military reverts you back to, say, like a local air, airport. And then the local airport, well, why don't you check with, you know, say, Boston and or, or the national. You know, they, they keep handing you off. I'm you sure want, part of that is, you know, part of that is that nobody wants to be the one to answer the questions. But part of that is they're hoping that in frustration, you'll eventually just break the cycle and hang up the phone. Essentially, yeah. yeah. And, well, 
I suppose, you know, we, we've talked about this in the past, but I suppose we should probably take some people through. And I'm trying to pull up here on the computer, but this computer is really slow. Uh, but I'm doing what I can to actually bring up the news report. And I'll talk a little bit about what was actually seen. And if, and if you saw these lights or if you know somebody that did, have them call in. You can call in 508 996 1420 There's also the chat room on SpookySouthCoast.com. Uh, under the Spooky TV banner. So there's something going on with the chat room. So with some of our chat room regulars, if you're having trouble, I don't, I don't know what's going on. But we'll figure that out as the night goes on. You can also email us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com. Those are the ways to get a hold of us. But again, the phone's the best way tonight. 508 996 1420 We want to hear what you saw in the sky. Because I've, I've been hearing that it's not just this past weekend. This, this rash of sightings that happened last Saturday night was enough to draw a lot of attention, but it's actually been going on for quite a bit. We're going to dig into that a little bit more yep. later on in the show. But before we talk about the specific case, walk us through the steps as someone who has investigated these cases. What happens when you have a sighting that you deem, or maybe it's not one that you deem worth following up. Maybe you just do due diligence on any sighting, but what is it, the process that you would go through as an investigator to try to find out the source and the cause of what's going on? Well, the, the basic things that you take into account is, okay, first off, who who is there? How many people were there? When did it occur? You know, the basic who, when, where, why, what type of questions. And then what you try and do is, uh, all right. From Wareham to Westport, it, <laughs> we've got you covered. AM 1420, WBSM. You knew that was going to happen. Yeah, I did, but... That's okay. Now, one of the first things you want to do is if, if it's just an oral report, you know, they're talking about something they saw, you take down the information and where they were and what have you. And you can go into your basic uh, internet searches looking at uh, local um, airports in their arrival and departure flights and stuff like that and try and arrange, you know, where where these flights would be. I mean, you can there are uh, various programs and stuff that will even show you where they were at what what particular flight was at what particular time and stuff like that rule out airplanes and other weather phenomena by checking various weather sites and meteorological sites as well as uh astronomical uh web pages to make sure the moon's in what phase and whatever you know most of that stuff can be done in about 20 minutes to what half an hour worth of web searching you find all the positions of where the normal explanation stuff is and if then there's nothing there. Then you go uh, digging in a little further by trying to find, uh, you know, some private stuff. You know, that's a little bit harder. That involves calls to local um, airports, mm -hmm. whereas in opposed to, like, the larger airports that have posted flights, it's a little bit more complicated, and sometimes it takes a day or two for people to get back to you. But it, And when you get things like this, where there's video and, and stuff like that, that's when you want to try and, you know, really nail some stuff down. And if you can get access to it, looking at radar or having a person that has access to look at the uh, radar, which actually is supposed to be public access to people. And, and somebody that I'm sure is a great help and a great assistance is somebody like ML Barron uh, down here uh, in Fairhaven, who's a weather watcher. Mm -hmm. But he's tied into a lot of these meteor meteorological services. And, you know, somebody like that is somebody that you can lean on who's working outside of... Uh, the this quote unquote system and might be able to get you some more information than you know the National Weather Service might tell you, you know, we're tracking weather man <laughs> we're way too busy to answer questions about UFOs but yeah well why don't we uh, read the story here we do have a call on the line we'll get right to that call in a minute I just want to read the story from the Standard Times website southcoasttoday.com and how it appeared odd airborne light spark UFO talk in South Coast this is a great story written by Brian Farraga uh, strange glowing lights appeared in the skies over south coast this past weekend, befuddling onlookers from New Bedford to Swansea and sparking talk of UFOs on social media. The curious used their smartphones to capture video and still images of the orange and reddish lights that flooded, uh, that floated in formation at times hovered in the air without making a sound. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Abdullah El Mali from New Bedford, said he was walking west on Elm Street toward Buttonwood Park around 6.30 p.m. last Saturday, listening to music on his iPhone when he looked up and saw four orb-like objects hovering in the air they were glowing like fireballs one of them changed colors from orange to a reddish color a bloodshot red and moved down very slowly said amali who added that one of the lights then quickly ascended i thought this is not natural this is not something you usually see he said and he added it was excited 
uh, just when he saw it. Let's see. It cannot definitively be determined what people saw in the nighttime southeast of Massachusetts skies. The Federal Aviation Administration did not receive or investigate any reports of UFOs in the region, said FAA spokeswoman Arlene Salak. New Bedford Mayor Scott W. Lang and Police Chief David Preventure said they were not aware of any city residents reporting UFO sightings. Rick Oliveira, a radio talk show host on a different station, said he saw two large unidentified flying objects over Ocean Grove in Swansea around 9.55 p.m. on Friday. Oliveira said one object appeared to be a large curved tube that swiveled and glowed a deep red before it suddenly curled into a ball and slowly elevated from its perch at about 1,000 feet. It was the most disturbing thing I ever saw, said Oliveira, who estimated that he and a friend were only about 300 feet away. My first thought was that this was an aurora borealis, but the last thing I expected it to do was to change shape before our eyes. I was literally in shock, Oliveira said. And on this story online, you can find the actual YouTube video. It's up on YouTube as well, uh, on the regular YouTube site as well. A few people have reported seeing similar airborne lights during the last two months near Buttonwood Park. That's during the last two months. They said the objects appeared to be sky lanterns, which are traditionally found in Asian cultures. They were orange circular lights, as they got closer to me, I could see they were flames. I'm almost positive they were lanterns, said Ryan Saucier, a New Bedford resident who saw the lights floating toward Arnold Street from Buttonwood Park. Ryan Carrero of New Bedford said he also saw about 10 lights in the sky near the park. I was in a parking lot and people were looking. They just kept rising upward, Carrero said. We've got you covered. AM 1420 WBSM. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Various news reports uh, indicate that airborne lanterns usually constructed from oiled rice paper on a bamboo. Hang on. I'm on a seat. All right. Uh, <laughs> Various news reports indicate that airborne lanterns usually constructed from oiled rice paper on a bamboo frame and containing a small candle that illuminates and elevates the lantern have been confused for UFOs in several locations, including Chicago, Utah, Russia, and England. Standard Times editor and associate publisher Robert Unger and his wife Barbara were traveling to an event at uh, the synagogue around 6.30 p.m. on Friday when they and several other people saw eight or ten lights drifting silently over Buttonwood Park for a minute or two before they each extinguished. I, for one, will be very disappointed if it's some wise guy in his backyard trying to fool everyone with lanterns or string of lights. I'm hoping it's the vanguard of a civilization of highly intelligent and attractive alien females trying to recruit earthling men, Hunger said. That's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why I get to be such a creative writer. For his part, Oliveira was adamant that he saw what, what he saw were not flying lanterns. When something 300 feet long changes shape in front of your eyes, that is no lantern, said Oliveira, who posted pictures and video on Facebook and YouTube. Oliveira said he has not been a believer in aliens or UFOs, but what he saw has troubled him. This kind of shakes you to the core because your whole reality changes if it's a military vehicle. I'm glad we have it because it will scare the expletive out of anybody, he said. So I just love that quote from Bob Unger because, you know, he, he takes it seriously enough that it's, it's newsworthy to put in the newspaper, but at the same time, he keeps very grounded about it and... That's, that's, he's just like that all the time. It's, it's great to work for a guy like that. All right, why don't we go right to the phones. And again, if you had a sighting of this UFO, just give us a call, 508-996-0500, We're hoping that, uh, that Bob Unger will call in a little bit later on and talk to us a little bit more. Uh, but uh, until then, we'll take your calls for sure. Let's go right to the phones. Hang on, because... Good evening, you're on WBSM. How you doing? Hello. Uh, hold on one second. We're having a little... There we go. You hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, God, it's like that phone commercial. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're doing a great job tonight, man. Thank you. Thank you. So did, did you happen to see these UFOs? I did not happen to see the UFOs, but I did catch it on Fox News the other morning. And uh, I saw the interview with Oliveira. And just kind of curious, because I know when I saw the interview on TV, they were saying he came out of the bar, but he had had just one beer mm -hmm. on his way home. Um, there was also something on that interview about a girl that admitted to letting the lanterns go. So, I mean, has anyone followed up on that side of things? Um, I know with the UFOs, it, it's easy with the, uh, like uh, Matt was saying, you check with the, uh, the Aviation Commission and stuff like that to make sure what planes are where and who's taken off from where. But but they didn't have any of that information, and someone was saying, hey, we'd let these things go. Um, has anyone followed up on that end of it? Uh, not that I've heard. No, and uh, you'll also get several other people saying that they let them go. You know, it's, it's people trying to insert themselves into the story, whether they, you know, actually did or not. You know, it's up to them to actually prove it. 
if you really want to get that kind of technical. I mean, anybody can say they did it. I can say I did it. Does, is that proof? No. But um, what you got to do is, like I said, you, you got to take the video, and then uh, eventually you got to try and see if you can replicate it. One way to do that is go to the source where this uh, occurred, look at the distances involved, get a replica of one of these lanterns, use the same type of recording device, and see if it matches up. It's not that hard. Now, and the other question I was going to have, too, is um, in that region, I mean, you've got the air base down the Cape. Do they still run a lot of planes and stuff out of there? The uh, Coast Guard does. It's, a, it's actually a very, very active Coast Guard base. Um, there's a, it's now National Guard, uh, small contingent of National Guard. The air wing that was in there actually moved out to the, uh, middle part of the state. There's still a small, uh, like a couple of fighters that are still there for active duty in case something's, get, you know, going to be launched out of there. But for there the most part. There is a whole fleet of black helicopters that they keep to, to fly over your house constantly too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, it is a, um, a. Uh, an army base there too, a reserve base there as well. I was just wondering if there was any type of uh, response, like air air wise, from the the National Guard. Or That's very very interesting that you say that because I remember that night, and I remember a whole bunch of helicopters being in the air, and I I noticed most of them actually were Coast Guard. Strangely enough. Hmm. Well, okay. I I just wonder how hard it would be, you know, to. I mean, not to get all conspiracy theory on everybody here, but if they wanted to put in some disinformation specialists, you know, how hard is it for that person to just be like, hey, I'm the one that set off these lanterns? You know, like you said, without any kind of proof, you know, they did it. I know in some of these other cases that we talked about in that story. Well, you get the same thing with murders. Just talk to, like, Lauren Coleman, the uh, copycat type of thing. You know, it's, it's just people trying to, you know. But in some of these other cases, these other countries where this has happened, you know, they've been at a party. So there's been a reason why there were lanterns set off. There's there's a wedding right. in one circumstance. But this, I mean, it doesn't seem like there was any kind of event going on or else a group of people would have come forward and said, yeah, I was at a party, yeah. you know, that we right. having a, a bonfire outside and we always set off some lanterns. Here's the video to our celebration, yes. Yeah. And here we are launching it. Something like that would be obviously videotaped and, you know, but uh, not saying it's not actually what happened we, like i said you just gotta remember a lot of people are going to want to jump in the story because it's getting attention sure all right well thank you for calling in have a good night guys all thank right, you take it easy and if anybody else wants to call in one 996 1420 is the toll-free number 508-996-0500 also email us spooky crew at spooky com as well now, one of the questions that I have is you've seen the video, the YouTube video that was in that Standard Time story. You've had a chance yeah, to take a look at uh, that. Uh, part of it, yeah. And I know that one of your concerns was that you're getting the YouTube compressed video and right. that makes it really hard to make out these lights. Uh, but, I mean, from what you could see, did they have similar you know, similar style of lights, similar patterns to, to other things that you've seen? It, it, not to downplay but it's a, it's a rather generic light in the sky type of video mm -hmm. you can't really get any good resolution out of it because like you it's on youtube youtube is well known for re re reducing and dramatically watering down the video quality because you, they need so much space uh i got a hold of um mr Oliveira, and i'm going to be meeting with him and downloading his copy directly and it was shot from a cell phone, was it? Yes. So that's automatically, I mean, sure, we have some, some pretty good high-end cell phone cameras now, but most of them are probably operating at a maximum of, you know, 8 megapixels yeah. for video. Um, and Which can be actually not bad, but I yeah, mean. Yeah, and, they're, they're, you know, a lot of these phones now have 1080p HD, you know, video camera capabilities. Well, well, what I'm looking for is the other data that goes along with it. It'll give me GPS coordinates and mm -hmm. several other things I can use to map things out for distances and stuff like that. I know that, you know, from the data on the phone, it'll say he was at this, and some of them may even have the inclination of which his camera was aimed up at. That can give me an idea of, you know, the angle to the sky that will give me also in terms of distance so I can replicate, you know, this with... Uh, other objects and it is amazing how video. it's amazing how easily lights can be mistaken uh you know, just the simplest lights i think it was it last summer that we had the ufo sightings happening uh over route 140 and it turned out that it was a light yeah. from the airport 
Uh, you know, we something were, that happens all the time, but just because of the cloud cover that particular night or the atmospheric conditions, it was reflecting in a different way that had people alerted. Well, I had to point that out to you one night coming in here, and uh, you were seeing this light in the sky, and I, I wound up pointing out it was um, the, actually the light from uh, New Bedford Airport. Yep. yep. The, strain, the, the only time, and I've been looking at the sky my whole life, I used to ride home in the back of my parents' station wagon whenever we'd go to visit my grandmother and I'd just stare at the stars all night waiting to see something in the sky because I figured if I spent enough time looking, sooner or later it would happen. And the one time that I've had what I would consider to be a UFO incident was, uh, I think it was the, the first Dead of Winter event that we did at Lizzie Borden's. Yeah. Driving home at like 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, and I'm coming over the uh, 195... You know, overpass here, going by Cogshaw and going down the street yep. there. And as I'm driving down the road, you know, heading in the direction of Wareham, I look out to the left-hand side, and up in one of the clouds, I see a light come out from behind one of the clouds and then dart over quickly and then fade out. And because of the, the, mo the fact that it came out from behind the clouds, so it was, to me, it was not a reflection. It was not coming from the airport or anything. It was actually moving from behind the cloud to in front of the cloud, whatever the source of this light is, and then it darted off and then flickered out. So it was, you know, something that I couldn't really explain. But again, it was 3.30 in the morning. I'd been up probably for like 27 hours. <laughs> so I, I didn't really think too much of it. Uh, but it does, you know, it does get your attention because from being – a layman for this type of stuff for being somebody that wasn't a ufo investigator and wasn't somebody who knew the steps to take uh prior to starting the show in 2006 to me i never would have thought when i was younger to watch the light i would have just looked for the light and, and to pick up on the anomalous motions of the light uh was something i wouldn't think to look for now i think in today's society People are more trained about it because we have so many of these cases popping up because of cell phone cameras, because of people having digital cameras, you know, because this technology is more available to us and people are capturing these lights, then we have a better idea of, okay, you've seen the light now, now what does the light do? So just seeing the lights now isn't enough anymore for some people. It has to be an anomalous pattern to the lights, an anomalous shine to the lights, you know, I mean... You taught me, you know, uh, driving to the show, you know, how to look for the different lights of the, you can tell if it's a helicopter or a plane, yeah, based on where the positioning of the lights are. Correct. Of course, uh, if the aliens are smart, they're putting the same light system on the bottom of their UFO to throw you off. <laughs> All right. Well, if uh, anybody else wants to call in and discuss, 508-996-0500, 996 Again, that video that was shot by Rick Oliveira is available on YouTube, uh, so you can check that out. And uh, when Moniz has the actual video, uh, we'll see if we can get permission from Rick to post it up uncompressed on Spooky South Coast uh, in some form or fashion. I say that thinking, you know, talking like I know what I'm doing when it comes to video uh, on the Internet, but uh, the silent assassin can figure it out, I'm sure. Now, one of the problems with UFO sightings, though, is people are still reluctant to come forward. On this program, since we started doing it, uh, like I said, in January of 2006, that's, that's a long time. And in that time, we've probably had maybe five or six people call in and share their actual UFO experiences, both recent and from years past. And there's still that stigma of reporting a UFO. Some people don't want to be seen as the person that is out there staring at the sky, that is out there looking for aliens. You know, just because you've seen a UFO doesn't mean you're saying that you saw a, a ship from another galaxy. It just means that you saw light in the sky that you can't explain. And, uh, you know, Matt Costa is the most skeptical person that I know when it comes to this kind of stuff because he doesn't want to believe in everything. You know, he wants to kind of look at it with a skeptical eye. Uh, so he's the, the type of person where if I see it and I say to him, hey, did you see that? And he's like, yeah, I saw it. And that looks strange to me. You know, that's that's going to be enough for me because I'm pretty sure at this point, like every light in the sky to me is something I'm going to watch and stare at. How does it feel to sit over on that table, sir? It feels weird. Yeah, it's, it's a different angle. I don't know if I you heard, know if I like it. I don't know if you heard the beginning of the program, I but uh, I, I was speaking with uh, with Ken Pittman. Uh, earlier today, he was in the Wareham Parade, living on a bad name, just 
rocked the hell out of the Wareham Christmas Parade. Thank you to everybody that came out. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. But uh, he asked me to if I was willing to come in here and do some fill-in shifts. So uh, he gave me a date at the end of the month. So I basically have just a couple of weeks here to figure out how to do everything here. And uh, so far, so good. We're on the air, as far as I know. Were you listening to uh, us in the car? No. Oh, so but. we might not be on the air. Uh, we did get a phone call. The chat room, by the way. I don't know what's going on with the chat room, but nobody's showing up in it. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. So Odd. there's that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to mess around with that. That's unique and different. Yeah, I'm going to mess around with that a little bit uh, during the news break. But so I, I basically have to learn how to do all this stuff. So far, we've only had the computer go off on us about four or five times. So that's good. I mean, compared to the last time I sat uh, in this seat. But I was realizing here, you know what I don't know how to do is run commercials. That's something we're going to have to work on. Because <laughs> we don't have yeah. commercials on the show. We always air them around our talk segments. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll get it all down. We don't need to pay bills. So now you were here last week. You know, you came in and did the show, but you came in a little bit later than us, and uh, you were coming in probably around the same time that these stories of these lights hit. I mean, a lot of these people were seeing them like around the time that you were driving in between 10, 1030. So did you happen to see anything in the sky? Anything that caught your eye that you didn't really think twice about? I haven't, no. Because we, we've had... Uh, We've had incidents before. Yeah, this must be my chat room. <laughs> Everybody's having fun, and I don't know what they're talking about. So we'll figure that out. Um, but are, are you like me? Are you somebody that's going to stare at the sky as you're driving down the road? Are you going to be, you know, watching? I mean, obviously, oh, I, well, I'm talking. Yeah, usually, I like to look at the <laughs> look road at the road when I drive. Yeah. Not always, except except <laughs> when you're looking down to grab a, another beer. But, uh, <laughs> No, at a stop sign, you do that. <laughs> but anyway, otherwise uh, it spills, right? Yes, no, we we do not encourage drinking and driving here. We're just we're just goofs. But um, but have you gotten to the point where like you've become accustomed to to looking at the night sky and to to kind of looking for these type of things? Because all right, in in the course of time since we started this show, I have definitely experienced ghosts. Yep. In my opinion, you know, I know you might debate me on that, but I've experienced ghosts. I've captured electronic voice phenomena. You know, I've I've seen people display psychic abilities that I never thought were going to be possible. With the exception of Matt Moniz, I haven't run into a cryptid yet. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure that's coming. So, like, all that's really left for me is to have that overwhelming UFO experience. Not that I'm calling on all occupants of interplanetary, but, <laughs> you know, but at some point, you know, that's that's got to be, like, the next thing for me to experience in my awakening to a lot of these things so i do look at the sky and i am out there searching for it i'm probably going to run like hell when i do see it because i want to see a ufo I where don't, are you going to run to i, well, <laughs> I just don't want to be abducted <laughs> yeah that may not be up to you i know but if, if i have any say in the matter i'm going to try to uh you know avoid it as much as you i say can. whatever you want if it's going to happen it's going to happen look i have a standing offer to the alien beings that may be involved in these abductions. You know, instead of taking me in secret, just hold off on that. Wait until you're ready to come public and then come here and use this forum. Any Saturday night they want to come in and sit down when they're ready. You know, I'm not pushing them to reveal now. You know, I'd, I'd like them to. I think it would be better if they did. But, you know, they've got their reasons for maintaining secrecy. And, of course, they're going to pick this show and, and not, you know, coast to coast. Oh. Yeah. They're just going to be like, yeah, well, you know, we're going to do it on a small station because, uh, you know, we just don't. Uh, we, ever since Ian Punnett announced that he's retiring, somewhat. By the way, our best wishes do go out to Ian Punnett. He's uh, his tinnitus is getting to the point where he can only pick his day job or coast to coast. So he's going to stick with the day job for now, and he's going to do the occasional coast to coast. But he is one of the reasons why we do this program. And uh, he's a good good colleague and a good friend, so we wish him the best. And uh, so that gets that out of the way because I, I kind of wanted to give him some well wishes, but I know that he's been flooded with them this week. So uh, what are you going to do over there, Casa, since you don't have to actually run anything over here? I'm monitoring the uh, chat room. That's a good idea. I'm thinking that if uh, during the news break, if I sign in under the name that you created, I should be able to yeah. to fix things over there but so we're talking about these south coast ufos that happened last weekend and i had mentioned earlier in the show matt moniz i had mentioned that 
this is something that's been happening for quite a while in this area. It hasn't just been this sighting last weekend, these sightings last weekend. It hasn't just been the last couple of months, as it mentioned in the story. I actually got reports from uh, someone that we know very well, uh, a science teacher in Wareham, who said that they've been going on since the beginning of the summer. True. Near the Cape. Uh, When I was uh, here on an early morning show uh, a couple of months ago, what was it about? Four months ago? I don't remember. Yeah. About three or four months ago, uh, we had reports coming in from people. And I even saw something the same night that another person had reported seeing the same kind of uh, weird light anomaly in the sky. And I found that rather intriguing. I'm not saying what I saw was necessarily the same thing they did, but it was interesting. Same time, same coloration same general direction heading and stuff like that it was you know one of these things that makes you sit back and look and then i started getting other reports because i get reports all the time from people and i noticed that this area definitely started heating up uh i would say in late april early may and is really starting to peak and and we're talking about near like the scusset beach area of i'm the talking Cape from and- p-town into connecticut this whole coastal the whole, region. Okay, that whole corridor. Well, one of the reasons why I, I wondered about these reports that I heard about happening in the you know the Scusset Beach area and, and down towards Sagamore and, and Bourne area, you're kind of in that, you're, you're right in between a nuclear power plant and a, and a Coast Guard base. A military base. Well, yeah. an, Air, an Air yeah. National yeah. Guard base. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's heavy, heavy with the Coast Guard right now. Yeah. But you have, you know, a, a military entity and you have a nuclear entity within a stone's throw of each other. Uh, not to mention another power plant in between, a hydroelectric plant, but uh, another one in between. So there seems to be... You're missing one other large uh, energy generating facility that most people don't pay attention to. Paypals. Which one? Paypals. You have no idea what that no, is. No, what's that? It's a large over-the-horizon radar system that is set up outside of uh, the local base down there. It, it's it's basically a gigantic electronic ear that looks for early launching uh, of stuff and monitoring. Is, is that what you can see when you're coming over the bridge and you you look over to the horizon? Is that yeah some of that some yeah. of those structures? Yeah, it's, it's a phased array radar assembly, and it's also a uh, they also do satellite tracking. You, you know who has been responsible for a lot of UFO sightings, which is funny, but I, I did read this online, is um, a lot of the uh, GPS mapping organizations, the people who go out there and they, mm-hmm. you know, they, they try to catch up on, because that, that stuff's so far behind. You know, like if you take a look at Google Images, for example, you're going to see a picture of your house like three, three years. Yeah, three cars before the one that you drive now. Yeah. So, but there are services now that are going out there and they've privatized that a little bit to where they're going out there and they're selling these images off to these other companies. Uh, and some of the craft that they're flying, the low lying craft that they fly, have been mistaken for UFOs, not because that they're radically different. You know, they might be in a low lying, you know, low helicopter, or like we see bog copters a lot yeah. and things like that, but they're flying lower to the ground than people are used to seeing. So that's been enough to cause panic. But I wonder if. You know, with all of this this Cape Wind stuff that's been popping up and all the reason why they would have to kind of survey by air a lot of that area, if that hasn't played into some of it. Well, you also got to remember, coastlines are usually large air corridors to start with anyway because it's uh, used for aerial navigation. You're, you're doing point-to-point along the coast for navigation. Where I am, I, it, I found out that the, the river estuary type of uh, spot where I live because of its unique location, is used as navigation point, and a lot of times for people using um, visual flight rules. Yeah, you know, that's why I have you know air vehicles flying over my house all the time. And that's why you have all those uh, weird contraptions built to kind of misdirect them. Uh, no, I don't have any weird contraptions. Just the, just, just the surface to air missiles. I was going to say the surface to air missiles. They they usually come out of. It's like remember Matt on mask. When uh, when the headquarters was hidden inside of a gas station. Yes, I do. Yeah, that's that. you should see like when when his house spins around and you see the, you know the battle side of it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I thought it just rises from the water. <laughs> it might. 
It might. He has like that's uh that's uh substation Atlantis. Yeah. <laughs> that's where he keeps the uh that's where the gun the little gun turret is. Yeah. You know, the Han Solo gun turret. So what's uh, what's happening in the chat room? Anything good? Anything we should know about since uh you can see it and I can't? Um they were commenting on your Santa hat. My Santa hat, yes. I was rocking Earl, this earlier. all day at the parade. I, I wore this all day. You you missed a, a heck of a parade, Matt. Yes, was it fabulous? It was. It was. We had uh, we had uh, local radio personality Pebbles, who is a Wareham native. Did the uh, did the Wareham uh, marching band show up? No, they did not show oh, up. They so were probably locked out of the. Whatever. Yeah, we have to figure out what went on with that. But uh, we did have a, a great performance from Living on a Bad Name with our own Ken Pittman, the WBSM afternoon host, rocking it. They're out in Brockton tonight, kicking some butt. Uh, but they uh, they did a great job, and people were were amazed by the fact that you know does he go all the, out does he dress up like bon jovi yeah i mean yeah they do um i mean ken has the the similar style to, to john bon jovi so he he tries to keep that in mind uh, during the performance is he from jersey um no i think he's from brockton oh. but uh tiktok was uh was drumming <laughs> and uh, he, he was uh he was doing a heck of a job and uh and I, all i remember is i left the parade and i'm driving up uh, Main Street to try to get to the town hall for the rest of the festivities there and probably like 40 cars in front of me is the flatbed with living on a bad name but I can still hear Ethan Brosh shredding just shredding and uh, it was kind of awesome to be able to yeah. just turn down roll down the windows and hear that so thanks to everybody out there that helped out with the Wareham Parade today uh, especially a, a special big shout out goes out to uh, to Jim and Morse Lumber and Wareham for their help South Shore Generator for their help JNR Towing, I know we didn't find you, but thank you for <laughs> helping out. And it was just, it was awesome to see everybody come down there and get involved. So many groups, and it's just going to be bigger and better next year. So, and it, the only bad part is they did the Festival of Trees afterwards, where you know everybody could put in raffle tickets and win these trees. And some of the trees, like all the businesses decorate the, decorated them uh, in a way to help promote their business. Some of these trees were pretty, pretty special. And some of them were decorated with scratch tickets all over them. Some yes. of them were decorated with nip bottles all over them. Empty Gift or full? Gift certificates to liquor stores. Huh? Empty or full? Uh, full. Oh. Yeah. With uh, some, some flavored vodkas on one of them. Actually, they were mostly all flavored vodkas, but they had like the cake flavored vodka and the lemonade flavored vodka. So we tried to win those naturally because after <laughs> a whole day of running the parade, you know, we needed some of that. But, uh, you know... We had one of the selectmen in town won three of the trees. That's not fair. That yeah. sounds rigged. Yeah, we, we were yelling rigged, too, every time they called his name. But it's good that he uh, put in so many tickets and bought so many tickets for a good cause. All the proceeds went to help Turning Point. So that's good. Speaking of uh, speaking of charities and Christmas, did we hear, uh, hear about Rock for Christmas, how good things went? Um, I, I know the New Bedford show um, went well. As far as the other shows, um, I think... I, I did I think they went all right, but I think um, next year everybody should go. Yes, absolutely. If Definitely. you weren't there, and you shouldn't just go to one, go to all four. Yeah, because if well. Wayne can drive, so can you. It's not that far. New York's not that far. No, no. It's like I think it's like six hours from here to here to Long and Island. It's for the children. So just go. Yes, as Eddie Money tells us all the time, it's for the children. It's for the kids. All right. Well, we are coming up on the news break in a few minutes. Uh, I I don't think I'm going to give you back your seat tonight. <laughs> I think you might have to stand over there, <laughs> or you can just stay seated there. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll talk more about some of these South Coast UFOs. We'll also throw open a whole bunch of other paranormal topics as well. I will get the chat room going correctly on my computer so that we can uh, bring in some of the points that are being made in there as well. Just go to Spooky TV on SpookySouthCoast.com if you want to get involved with the chat room. Don't forget, too, it's not just our show that airs on Spooky TV. On Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock, we have Spirit Connections with Tiffany Rice. That's also simulcast on Wareham Community Television. Uh, I know it's Verizon Channel 30. I don't remember what the Comcast channel is anymore. Is it, I think it's like 14? No. Channel, what, 9 or 8? Is it 9? Nine, 9 or 8? Comcast. One of the, yeah. Oh, the old classic Bay 8. 
So, uh, <laughs> but you can check it out on Spooky TV, of course, as well. Uh, on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock. And then on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern Time is our newest show, Guardian Radio with Danielle Arnold. Uh, there was an issue with Ustream last week where her second episode didn't record, but her first episode is archived up there if you want to check that out. I think it had an issue with recording, Matt Costa, because she went for like four hours. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and I love doing Spooky South Coast. I love talking about the paranormal with people. I don't know if I could talk about the paranormal for four hours. But uh, Danielle did it, and she did a great job. So uh, if we, even if we can't find that archived episode, be sure to tune in each week at 9 o'clock. And all these shows, they're all right on the same page, Spooky TV. It's uh, SpookySouthCoast.com slash Spooky TV, where you can see the video, watch the shows, jump into the chat room and interact with the hosts and ask questions and interact with each other. And it's just a, it's a great time because I go in there like during these other shows, and I end up spending the whole time talking to some of our regular spooky south coast fans that i don't get the chance to talk to during our show because we're so busy with all these other things going on so it, uh, it's almost like a de facto just a little chat amongst ourselves uh but it's it's always a great time so check those shows out tuesday nights at eight o'clock spirit connections thursday nights at nine o'clock guardian radio and if you have an idea for a show and you'd like to bring it to spooky tv just let us know so matt costa i think i'm gonna be all set here with the legal id because well, i know i can good. i can play it by myself if i have to um, wait, which one is it? <laughs> is it the one that says liner? Yes, riveting radio for you. Of course. Click, Click manual. <laughs> <laughs> Click legal ID auto. Change next. Yep. Okay, Maybe so that's that's just going to go off on its own. You could just stand behind me. I'm enjoying this seat. Well, we're going to know in about uh, seven seconds if it's going to work. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more after the news here on Spooky South Coast. First, with local Your news, local talk, and sports, news, sports. News, this is week. WBSM New Bedford, AM 1420, WBSM, a cumulus station. Individual mandates, my friend. You know what? You've raised that before, Rick. And uh, you're still, simply it wrong. Was, it was true then. No, no. <laughs> Sparks flew, but did anybody get burned? Rick Perry and Mitt Romney. They're sparring on health care reform in the just over ABC News debate of the Republican presidential contenders in Des Moines. Ron Paul. If you embark on instituting a society where government protects you from yourself, you're in big trouble, and that's what they're doing. The character issue, Gingrich addressing his past infidelity and divorces. In my case, I've sat up front openly. I've made mistakes at times. I've had to go to God for forgiveness. I've had to seek reconciliation. But I'm also a 68-year-old grandfather, and I think people have to measure who I am now and whether I'm a person they can trust. Michelle Bachman started lumping Gingrich and Mitt Romney together, alleging they're not real conservatives. If you look at, at, at Newt Romney, they were for Obamacare, principles. If you look at Newt Romney, they were for cap and trade. Gingrich denied Bachman's allegations. Rick Santorum called himself the only one among them who's gotten anything done in Washington. You're not going to hear them talk about all the positions I took and flip-flopped on. I was there, I led, and I won. Gingrich defended a remark he made earlier to a TV channel, the Jewish channel, saying the Palestinians are an invented people. They never had any states. Is what I said factually correct? Yes. Is it historically true? Yes. And says Gingrich, Palestinian schools teach hatred of Jews. The ABC News Republican debate was at Drake University in Des Moines. Iran summoned Afghanistan's ambassador, protesting violation of its airspace by what's claimed to be a remote-controlled unmanned U.S. spy plane based in Afghanistan. Mass protests growing in Russia. Fourth day brought tens of thousands in Moscow, calling for an end to Prime Minister Putin's rule amid allegations of vote fraud at last weekend's parliamentary elections. One demonstrator in Moscow. With these uh, thieves, Russia has no future. You're listening to ABC News. Calling people using long distance was draining my wallet. So to save money, I'm only calling people with toll-free numbers. Do any of my friends have them? No. Any family members? Nope. You know, no one I call has a toll-free number. So, Mom, if you're listening, I got your messages. Tell Cousin Tommy I hope all is well. And honestly, would it hurt you to look into an 800 number? I'm your only son, for crying out loud. There's an easier way to save. Get online. Go to geico.com. Get a quote. Or follow this guy's toll-free pension and call 1-800-947-AUTO. 
Print from anywhere for less with new Kodak Hero Series all-in-one printers. They're Google Cloud Print compatible, so you can print photos and documents from a tablet, smartphone, or laptop on the go. And always save with the lowest total ink replacement cost. Saving money never looks so smart. Go to staples or staples.com for great savings on Kodak Hero or other Kodak all-in-one printers. This week at Staples. Lowest total ink replacement cost is compared to leading consumer inkjet printers using manufacturer's recommended standard ink cartridges available in single quantity pricing. Another take on what the Republican nominee could face as President Obama this week defended his foreign policy record, citing Osama bin Laden and the 22 other top al-Qaeda leaders killed in recent months. ABC's Christian Amanpour. The president has really inoculated himself, his administration, and the Democratic Party on an issue of national security that the Republicans are always accusing the Democrats of being weak on. So having taken out Osama bin Laden and any number of al-Qaeda leaders and having conducted the most drone strikes of any president, certainly more than President Bush, he's really put that to rest. And some Republican strategists admit that as well. At the same time, these Republican candidates are sort of drawing the tent in when it comes to foreign policy, not wanting any intervention. Ahead of a Tuesday hearing, ABC's T.J. Winnick has an update now that former Penn State assistant coach Jerry Sandusky's wife has said that the people accusing her husband of sexual abuse are lying. Victim number nine told the grand jury he saw Dottie at the house, but she never came downstairs. And that at least once he screamed for help, knowing that Sandusky's wife was upstairs, but no one came to help him. Ben Andriozzi represents victim number four. We will likely hear more information specifically from victim number four as to Mrs. Sandusky and what information Mrs. Sandusky may have known about the actions of her husband. In a statement, Donnie Sandusky broke her silence Thursday, saying she has been shocked and dismayed by the allegations. This is ABC News. Does your roof need replacing, your house need cleaning, or maybe you're ready to update your kitchen? Big or small, whatever your home improvement need, log on to home.servicemagic.com. Service Magic is a free online resource with instant access to pre-screened remodelers, maids, handymen, painters, and many other home contractors. It's easy and it's free. Just go to home.servicemagic.com. Home.servicemagic.com. That's home.servicemagic.com. Chuck Sievertson, ABC News. I'm working two jobs, and my husband works too. My kids go to school with your kids. I sit next to you at PTA meetings. We live right next door. We've been neighbors for years. You know my family and me pretty well, but here's one thing you don't know. I'm one out of every six Americans, and my family is struggling with hunger. Like you, we believe in this country. What's hard to believe is in the land of milk and honey, how many hardworking Americans have to choose between paying bills and feeding their families. This is a problem with a solution. Please visit feedingamerica.org today and find your local food bank for ways to help. Every dollar you donate helps provide seven meals for those around you quietly struggling with hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Ask the Mayor with Scott Lang, here at Monday Afternoon at 5 on The Ken Pittman Show. Brought to you by Jose Matos of the Advanced Financial Group, by a a Jewelers, on AM 1420 WPSM. Unfortunately, many people facing foreclosure believe they're on a one-way street. How did I end up here? Please take next exit. What? But there is no exit. It may not seem that way now, but I'm giving you the right directions to help you save your home from foreclosure. Okay, talking to my GPS. I must really need help. Facing foreclosure alone is stressful. You know That's why you need advice from a HUD-approved housing counselor. They offer expert, trustworthy advice that might help you avoid foreclosure no matter how...
difficult the situation seems. It's difficult, all right. And best of all, the advice is free. Wow. Now please exit this road you've been on for far too long. Facing foreclosure? Don't go it alone. Get the right directions from a HUD-approved housing counselor today. For more information, visit www.hud.gov slash fair housing. That's hud.gov slash fair housing. A public service message from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. AM 1420 WBSM presents Spooky South Coast with your hosts Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. All right, welcome back to Spooky South Coast, hour number two. Tim Weisberg here along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa, who stepped out of the room for a minute, and science advisor, Matt Moniz. I guess that means he trusts me, because I don't think I can ever remember him leaving the room while that red light is on. <laughs> so I guess that means I must be doing not too bad of a job. You're working it. You're working it. Well, hey, we're on the air again for another hour, so that's that's pretty good. The fact that I can get us on and off the air works. So we were talking in the first hour about... These local South Coast UFO sightings that happened last weekend and have been happening over the last few months, and we don't, we certainly don't want to limit the discussion to just that. I mean, if as Moniz was, we were talking about uh, during the break, there's a lot of reports that have happened here over the years that we might have not have heard before. Uh, I can only remember maybe a, a small handful that we've heard over the last few years of doing this program that people have shared with us. So if you have a sighting that happened to you, call in and share. You never know when you saw something, and somebody else saw it too. So just give us a call, 508-996-0500, 996 And we have the chat room working now on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com, so you can jump in there as well uh, if you want to join in the discussion. And I can see, you know, all the, the usual folks are in there, so I apologize if we missed some of your comments, you know, in the first half of the hour. We, we, had, we should probably explain to people why we had to make the change uh, in the chat room. With our new show... Guardian Radio, and with the new influx of people that have come to Spooky TV over the last few weeks, you know, we found that there are some people who are from outside the Spooky family. You know, our, our listeners are great. We trust them completely. We don't need to moderate the chat room uh, when our show is going on because our chat room members are happy to do it amongst themselves. And Quite frankly, some of the stuff they say in the chat room might not make it past the moderator if there was one there. <laughs> <laughs> and we like it that way. But uh, there were some issues with, with uh, some of the other programs, so we needed to make a change so that we could put in moderator status for people and, and have people have the ability to keep people from coming in and using the wrong username or you know putting things in there that weren't appropriate. There were some inappropriate comments made. So things like that had to be taken care of. So that's why the coding has changed. And it looks like everybody's able to keep their same login names and everything. And Mac Costa put together a great new uh, Zat chat box with the Spooky South Coast logo in it. So you know, it looks it looks more like uh, more like we own it now. Hey man, I turned on every mic That's but yours. Fine. We're I apologize. stepping it up. That's all. Trying trying to church up Spooky South Coast. <laughs> well, as we as we move along here, and we are, I, I should point out to people, we're going to be here next week. With a, with a show for you. But then the next two weeks after that, of course, are Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. We're not going to be here those weeks uh, because Christmas Eve, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that all of us would much rather be <laughs> doing something else. And New Year's Eve, I don't leave the house. I stay home. I don't, I don't leave the house. I don't take that risk. So, uh, you know, 
and to me, it's like, well, you know, we're going to do the show, and the diehard fans that are going to come and listen to the show, we're taking away their time with their families. Yeah. You know, and and most of them, if they're sane, are going to spend time with their families instead of listening to Spooky South Coast. So we're going to take a, a couple of weeks vacation, but then we're going to be back in 2012 with a whole new bunch of shows, and we've got some big stuff happening. We've got some big uh, some big guests planned. We have some new and different ideas planned. Uh, Chris Balzano and I are coming out of our book project that we've been working on that has been eating up so much of our time, and we're going to start putting a focus on putting together some really bang up shows. Uh, coming up in 2012, just some of the things that we can talk about, you know, boggle my mind when I when I realize that we're about to enter essentially our seventh year of yeah. broadcasting. And <laughs> that sounds weird, but um, there's so many topics that we've never covered, things that we could dedicate entire shows to that we just haven't had the chance to hit upon yet. So we're going to explore all that. And if you have any ideas of what you'd like to hear on the program. Please email us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com. That goes to myself, to both Matts, and to Chris. So you'll be uh, getting all the important decision makers about what we talk about. And, you know, some of the, some of the shows that we do, you know, we, we get really ambitious about. And, you know, we take it into a different direction than it's, than it's supposed to be. It doesn't have to be like that every week. You know, some weeks we just like to have fun. It doesn't have to be earth-shattering stuff that you're suggesting. It doesn't have to be, you know, revolutionary within the world of the paranormal. It doesn't have to be big projects like the old-time radio shows that we've done in the past or, you know, our, our, our War of the World hoax or things like that. It can just be a bunch of guys talking about something, but you tell us what you want to hear us talking about. That's the way this show works. It's your show. We're just here because... An on-air version of the Backyard Barbecue. <laughs> We're just here because one of us knows how to run all this equipment. And just right now, he's the furthest away from it. <laughs> but we're just the conduit to bring the guests to you. That's the idea behind this show. So I know there's other paranormal shows out there. And hey, this is something we could talk about here in this hour, too, because we've recently added a program to Spooky TV. And it lends to the discussion of, you know, how much time are people dedicating to, to watching these shows and to listening to radio shows. Uh, I think that you're finding more of these paranormal radio shows are popping up, but the question is who's listening to them? You know, is, is it, is it a case where they're getting as many downloads as they might have a few years ago? Or is it a matter of, you know, there's uh, enough, I know the interest is there, but is there enough people doing something different to make it worthwhile? I can tell you there's, and I'm not going to name any, shows here but there's probably 50 paranormal internet radio shows that are on every night of the week and i couldn't differentiate one from the next because they're all basically following the same format um they're all basically booking the same guests and the only people that are listening to the shows are the other team members of the people that are running that show or the other team members of whoever they're bringing on to that show let's face it that's just the way that this works I can't think of any other topic out there that has this glut of programming dedicated to it. And I say programming, you know, realizing that a lot of this stuff is it's on demand things that you're going to be seeking out on your own. It's not like it's, you know, taking up a time slot. Oh, I, I think clogging does, you know, have a, it is, a, a it heavy is, following. Um, it, it, but it is, you know, when when you think about it, though... It is a niche, as much as we like to hope that the paranormal is starting to become mainstream, it is a niche topic. And when you go to something like Blog Talk Radio, you're not going to find, you know, 350 shows about carpentry. You're not going to find 450 shows about fishing. You know, there's, it's just, it's more than, and I know, Matt, you don't even really pay attention to any of this stuff. What stuff? <laughs> you don't, but you you don't really follow a lot of these radio shows. I hardly follow this show. That's a good point. That's no, good I don't. Point. I don't know. I think it's um, we don't compare ourselves to other shows, so therefore, you don't you don't feel a need yeah. to. You're not you don't need to. You don't consider them competition, so you don't have to size <laughs> them up. No, well, I mean, but what we do is different. And I think that's what a lot of people don't realize ourselves. Darkness Radio, a few other shows. We're the only ones that are actually 
privileged enough to be broadcasting terrestrial. Like Todd Seat's Night Watch and stuff. Well, and the, I think the reason that they're different is all of these shows that you're mentioning, were, they're also aired on terrestrial radios where we have uh, different sets of rules and certain uh, formulas we really got to go by. Put it this way. Some of these shows that I've heard, and again, we know we're not pointing any fingers because Matt Moniz and I, we've been guests on a lot of these shows. Yeah. But and and all the ones that I you know been on you know I've enjoyed my time talking to them. I might not think that they're the most necessary shows, but they're giving me a platform to talk about my work. So you know I I think that they should have the same opportunity that I do. But the difference is, if we don't deliver a worthwhile program every week, then they don't have to let us into the building. You know if we're not <laughs> providing quality radio, which I hope that we do. I mean, it could just be a matter of nobody's listening, you know, from the station. They're all asleep because they, they're here uh, Monday through Friday. And they're like, I'm not going to listen to the station on my day off. But, you know, we like to think that we're providing quality entertainment that is worth letting us come in and use this airtime. When you don't have that kind of restrictive nature to what you're doing, then it doesn't – you're not – you're not trying to fit the mold of what a radio show should be. You're not trying to keep both the broadcast ethics and the broadcast professionalism to what it is that you're doing. I, I, I tell the same story all the time. I listened to a show once about uh, w- with uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley as the guest. And the two hosts spent – they had Rosemary on the line, connected. And they spent uh, probably about 25 minutes just talking about themselves to themselves – a conversation that should have happened off air while they have one of the preeminent authors and authority figures in the world of the paranormal waiting on the phone and forced, by the way, not just sitting there waiting, but forced to be a third party to that conversation in a way that clearly made her uncomfortable. And God bless Rosemary because she did all she could to, to get through that discussion. But what is it about being in this field that you have to be a media personality as well. I mean, why is it that you, uh, so many people feel the need to go out and investigate the paranormal and then produce a show where they can talk about it? It's baffling to me. And I've been thinking about this more and more over the last few weeks because more and more of these shows I'm finding out that I never knew existed. Why do they? The only thing that I can think about, the only thing that pops into my head It's the same reason why we do this program. It's a way for them to have the discussions, excuse me, and ask the questions and be involved in the search for the answers that you might not get otherwise. They're looking for the the reasonable explanation to talk about it in a public, in in an open forum. Is that what you're saying? It's almost like by doing this show, by doing their show, it's their way of having the discussion. It's their way of picking the brains of people uh, where they might not have a chance to otherwise. It's almost like it's almost like it's an on-air chat room. Well, you're right because in some cases, uh, uh, and you know from doing some of these investigations yourself here, a lot of people will not talk to you about you know these experiences that they've had, you know, as a person to person. But if you're going at them as a radio personality or, or in your case, journalism or whatever, I'm looking for this information, then, then they're more apt to share it with you because you're looking for their input in a professional manner. It's not just, hey, can you tell me what you saw? You know what I'm saying? This is like I'm putting together this collection with everybody else's collection. What can you contribute to it? It look, makes it a little bit easier for the person to volunteer the information. And it's not just, uh, and I, I know that it sounds like I'm picking on, you know, radio shows for, but I also noticed that uh, cable access is chock full of paranormal investigation shows. It's like that's another vehicle for people to, you know, put out their own work. And nah, not at all. But saying coming from one of the thirty odd. <laughs> but but wait a minute now, because thirty odd minutes is is a different entity than some of these other programs so i'm involved in two unique entities great uh, if they're both how many (laughs) unique entities have have you met over your (laughs) year that's a very loaded question but 
I, I consider 30 odd minutes to be different because for one, just knowing Jeff Belanger and knowing, you know, he's he's not going to put it out either if it's not quality. Very true. I because can definitely vouch for that. Not only is, let's face it, I mean, in some cable access, and Matt, you studied cable access in school, I'm sure, to some degree. Yep. When people go, they take the course, they pay the money to take the course, they become part of the organization, and they want to produce a show, you kind of got to let them produce the show. So there's not a lot of adherence to really good quality standards. You know, that's why we watch some of these shows and we, we laugh at some cable access programming. But Jeff Belanger has the self-filter of he's not going to put his name on something that he doesn't feel is a strong, entertaining product. So that's why that's a little bit different. But it seems to me like there's two ways that people look at broadcasting the paranormal. And that's either they want to get closer to the stars or they want to become stars themselves. You know, that's the bad side of it. You're the, talking the para-celebrities. The para-celebrities, which I'm trying to not use that word because, you know, there's there's a lot of negative connotation with that word now. But, uh, you know, through no fault of the people who have achieved that status, you know, nothing against them, but people either want to get close to them or they want to surpass them or be equal with them. That's the... the the, the bad reason to get into it. We talked about the good reason being the fact that you can use it as a way to explore and to find answers and to ask questions and to, to get resources that you wouldn't get. I mean, yeah. little did I know, you know, six years ago that I could have just called John Zaffis on the phone <laughs> and he would have been happy to answer any questions that I had for him. But I was excited to be able to get him onto this program because here's somebody whose work I admired and respected and I'd seen over the years and I really wanted to pick his brain. So, to me, the show was a vehicle for that. Brad Steiger, the show was a vehicle to talk to somebody whose work I admired and to learn more about Rosemary. We had her on. You know, so many of these people who are the, the heroes of my generation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're the people that I wanted to, to learn about and I wanted to learn from. But there is a lot of that aspect now is let's get Jason and Grant, you know, try to get them on our show. You know, or any, any of these people who are on television. Oh, let's see if we can get Zach on. Let's, yeah. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is you find that, you know, even people that have been involved in it for years are no longer doing the radio shows. But the problem with that is, is when you're doing that, and I'm not, not putting anybody down here. And I know I say that. I say that a lot. I really do qualify what I say quite a bit. And I, it's not that I don't have a strong stance on it. It's just that I know that anything that I say can be so misconstrued because of the Are you talking the about drama being turned, yeah, turned in, into in, drama? In this field. So I, I'm, I'm careful to not let anything be misconstrued and, and try to be clear with what my points are. But I don't see the point of bringing Jason and Grant onto a show like this, like ours, like Spooky South Coast, except to talk to them about what it's like to be Jason and Grant and to have to be, you know, to the to get to the point where they got to, what it's like to investigate for a television show, what it's like to have to go from being everyday guys to being, you know, celebrities. You know, those are the kind of things that I would talk to them about. Right. And you and I both know them very well personally, and they've always said, yeah, anytime you want us to come on, they would. And, you know, I think, and it's no uh, slight to Jason or Grant, but I, I, I think we do pretty well even without them. Well, yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? Not, not to belittle anything that they've done, but, you know. And certainly not to stroke ourselves any, but, but yeah, I mean, to have them on, you're right. We would talk about things that would be interesting to us. You know, everybody else would be more interested in, you know, the shows and, and this and that. We're more interested in them as the people because we know them as the people. The, the, the whole roundabout point that I'm making in a very long-winded way that's probably boring everybody out there that's listening is I'm trying to envision the future of what this show is because – Radio shows don't last into seven years. It, radio shows do not get that opportunity. I mean, you get the rare, you know, the, the DJs of, you know, music stations who carve out their niche. You get some of the talk show hosts on the local level, like here on WBSM, who carve out their niche. But generally, you don't have a show that has 
you know, not to pat ourselves on the back here, but has the appeal of ours and where you're in a position like we are where we don't make any money for doing it, <laughs> you know, anybody else would probably have packed it in by now. Most people probably would have packed it in by now and said, you know, it worked out good, um, but, you know, I need to focus my efforts somewhere else. The point is, and people say to me, you still do that show? And I said, well, yeah. Getting paid for it yet? No. Then why do you do it? Because I learn from it and because I enjoy it. Exactly. And because I like when I bring a guest on. Look and at all the great people we've met in doing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking the uh, the people in the field. I'm talking a lot of our listeners as well. A lot of them have become very good friends. And And that's what matters to me is when one of those people say to me, the guest that you booked or that Chris booked, you know, really had an impact on me. And we were that conduit. We brought somebody to the forefront um, that, you know, somebody might not have known about before. So my whole big roundabout point is envisioning the future here as we go forward. I want to get more into some of these people that you haven't heard of. I want to get into some of these people who are working in this field and haven't. The behind the scenes. Not necessarily behind the scenes, but just have something new and unique and different to bring to the table. We find that in this field, we recycle a lot of the same information. Who has new and different information? Who has a new perspective on the information that we've had for years? That's what we really need to start focusing on. We need to have less focus, and I'm not talking about this show, but just the paranormal in general, less focus on recycling the same quote unquote talking heads. You know, the same people who are watching the presidential election, you know, watching the, the gear up toward the presidential election and looking at some of the candidates that are outlasting and the ones who are falling behind. And they're saying, gee, you know, some of these, the Herman Cain types, you know, the Michelle Bachmans, people who are new to the scene and for whatever reason, I know that they've all had issues and reasons why, but these are the people that are following by the wayside and the focus becomes on the Newt Gingriches, the, the Mitt Romneys, the people who have been there before. And so you kind of fall into that sense of security of, well, here's, here's somebody that we know. Here's somebody the that we can get quantities. behind. quantities, yeah. You know, it, with, with President Obama, it was different. You know, it was somebody that was out there and radical and a change and change was needed, and it seems like they're going back to the standbys now. And that's what I think a lot of the paranormal broadcasting has done. It's, it sticks to the standbys, or it sticks to the same formats. You know, so many of these other shows I'm talking about are, let's bring on such and such a person from this group and talk about what they do. They're looking for the comfortableness in an uncomfortable subject. Let me ask you this. Is there, when you're listening to some of these shows where people are coming on and talking about what they've experienced as investigators, are they telling you something that you haven't heard before? On a couple of occasions, yeah. And when they're telling you something that you haven't heard before, is that lost sometimes amongst the more, what's almost become mundane? You know what I mean? Like, you have to really listen to find those nuggets of what's different. I see you here and when we have some of these guests on that we have, you know, talking, we'll be talking about a subject and you, you might, you know, not seem 100% engaged in what they're saying because you've kind of heard it all before. You've, you've yeah. been in this a lot longer than we have. But then something will happen where you have a sit-up moment and say, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just find that those wait-a-minute moments are happening less and less when, when I'm listening. And I don't know if it's because we talk to such a wide variety of people here or if it's that we're just getting a lot of regurgitation. There's a lot of regurgitation in the paranormal field right now. I would agree. I, I mean, you go back all the way, you know, from Harry Price to today. I mean, there's only so much you can really, you know, go beyond. I mean, th the only thing that's really different now is all the new uh, toys, basically, you get to play with in it. And, and new open opening locations that uh, uh, never let people in before. But for the most part, you're going in, as if you're talking about paranormal investigation, you're going into a haunted place and looking to have an experience. The only thing that's different from back in the day is now we've got better cameras and recorders and stuff to you know, document the event. But everybody's going out and buying the same equipment, utilizing the same equipment. And all talking about it the same and, you know. Yeah. We're not getting the 
new discoveries. You know, we're not getting to talk to the people who are working on something different. Uh, you know, it, it's almost like something doesn't become an approved piece of paranormal tech until it appears on a paranormal television show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's that's just not the way that it should go. I mean, there should be the opportunity to express. A, I, I I don't. It sounds almost like I'm saying I'm getting bored here, you know, doing this show. But I just feel like it's almost a qualifier when people say I want to come on your show and I want to talk about this. Well, we talked about that. You know, you need to bring something different to the table. And that's what I'm finding that I'm getting in a lot of the emails that we receive now is we're getting people that are saying, I have something different. I have something that's... So it's not just me that's perceiving this. It's the perception out there that it is time to have some new discussions within the paranormal. So let's go to the phones here. We have a call. And uh, hopefully this is somebody that's going to say, oh, yeah, you guys are right on point and not boring me to tears. <laughs> Good evening, you're on Spooky South Coast. How you doing? Killing me. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's going. It's Dave. How you doing? Hey, Dave. Uh, listen, I was I listened to the whole show, and it's really cool. I um, totally agree with everything you're saying. Um, right now, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, what I'm doing is trying to help people out with the fraud end of things. You got all these groups that are jumping into the uh, fray. They're posting pictures, and they're telling clients and stuff, hey, you have like a ghost in your house and we can prove it. We have a picture of this with a bunch of orbs and this and that. And um, a couple of weeks ago, we started that thing with the, um, on Facebook. Yeah, the paranormal peer review. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, trying to help people out, it kind of stalled out for a little bit, but I still see it almost day to day to day. There's so much. The technology isn't really helping things anymore. It's almost kind of a joke to a point. Um, There's so much stuff coming out. People are selling all these new devices and everything. I saw one today. Uh, Someone's trying to sell a device that you can set down, and the ghost can touch it and press on a button that lights up, and it will tell them that a ghost is talking to them because the electrons are working through it. And... I sit there and I scratch my head going, how can we tell people that this is actually what's happening? We have no idea what's going on, mm-hmm. you know? It's... So I, 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 I've heard every word you said tonight, and you're right. You're totally right on the money. Um, I've, got, I've got so much that I just, I, I really want to spot out, but you guys <laughs> are doing a lot better job than I am. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean... Uh, no, you're, you're you some... are. No, you are. It's... Uh... Well, we know that you're somebody that pays attention to the field, and and the the fraud aspect has been something that's been, been rampant. Yeah, but what bothers me is not the hoax fraud. The hoax fraud, I almost can swallow like a spoonful of Vaseline because I know that's going to happen. I know that when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, it is easy to fool people, and to a lot of people, fooling people is the shortcut to getting famous, to getting attention, to getting whatever it is that you crave that you need to find the reason to hoax something. So a hoax fraud, to me, is almost like it comes with the territory. You know, you got to deal with it. But what bothers me more about it is the uninformed fraud or the uh, almost like the I'm trying to be helpful fraud, which is the situation that we ran into that allowed us to force us to create paranormal peer review is it was people who were giving false information, but they thought they were right and they thought they were helping. And it's just uneducated, uninformed, almost like I'd rather give you an attaboy than help you figure out what's going on. You mean to help quell the armchair, uh, basically the armchair expert? type of thing yeah Yeah, it's somebody who can look back and say you know yes you're right you do have a ghost and not give you um a a path of deduction to follow to get there the the what's happening is you're having less of a focus on what the phenomena is and more of a focus on whether or not you can capture it Mm. yeah would you agree with that dave oh no totally i would agree with that um I've done cases with people. Uh, I talked. I did a case here in my town. Um, they had a person that came in and informed them that they had some type of an evil entity that had attached themselves to the house, and 
if they didn't come in and help them, that this thing would continue to bother them. And I asked them, I said, well, what did they tell you? Where did they get this information from? It's, oh, they, um, they learned this from television. And, oh, oh well, great. So, yeah. And, yeah, and I chased those people down. And, of course, by the time I tried to chase them down, there was nothing there. There was actually there was no group left or anything at that point. But The damage had already been done. Yeah, and, well, in, at least the, that person wasn't totally believing whatever they were hearing, you know, that's the trouble. I've, I've done cases where we've had to explain to people what's going on. They, they want to believe that something paranormal is going on. And you're saying, no, no, you've got this going on, and this is happening. Um, your heater is pumping out a whole ton of carbon monoxide. Um, you really need to have someone check your house out. But they still want to believe that their house is haunted. If the wrong person comes in, I mean, what are we looking at? I mean, someone could die it in that type of case if mm -hmm. you get something like that going on. So, I almost think some of these paranormal shows should start off with that disclaimer. You know, yeah. like, uh, yeah. don't try this at home. <laughs> you know, these people are, are trained professionals. <laughs> I said that when I first started seeing them. Trained professionals. That's yeah. Except, <laughs> that's some, that's except, about it. Yeah. Some of these some of these shows should probably start off with the uh, the old disclaimer they used to run in front of Beavis and Butthead. And I would admit, I'm not a trained professional either. I mean, I was a printer for eight years, so, I mean, I'm not a ghost hunter, but... But at, le at least there are people I, I, who I've are I've been informed. able to step back and had people tell me, hey, you're wrong with this, and listen to them. And I think that's the biggest trouble with researchers in general, is most of them don't want to be told they're wrong. Yeah. And I can tell you, you know, no offense toward the TAPS website, they've done a great job, but you're not going to learn everything you need to know about paranormal investigation by going to the TAPS website and just reading the glossary of terms. Yeah. You know, it says there's more to it than that. So, but uh, no, I think I think some of these shows would need that Beavis and Butthead type disclaimer. Uh, Jason and Grant are not human. They're cartoons. They're not even real. <laughs> some of the things they do could cause a person to get hurt, maimed, destroyed, possibly deported. To put it another way, don't try this at home. I can't believe I remembered that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dave, for checking in. We get another call. Hey, happy holidays, guys. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep, All right. Good evening. You're on Spooky Ooh. South Coast. Oh, hello. That's the wrong line. Good evening. You're on Spooky South Coast. How you doing? Good. How you guys doing? Oh, we are spooktacular. So what, what do you think? I'm sorry? What are your thoughts on, on the discussion we're having here? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm a first-time caller, Dan. I uh, love your show. Um, you. I was thinking about uh, what Matt said about uh, the industry being stale. And there's actually a gal, uh, her name is Julie Bysol, and she's part of windbridge.org. And she's uh, a scientist that's actually doing quadruple blind experiments with um, psi and survival consciousness. And I think she's doing some, like, really interesting things, and that might be somebody you guys uh, could look into as a guest. Uh, her sure. her views and her studies are actually really amazing. So uh, if you have a chance, uh, go ahead and check out windbridge.org and uh, learn more about Julie Bysol. She's done some really cool stuff. Well, if you can do me a favor, if you can forward me a link uh, to Spooky Crew at SpookySouthCoast.com. Yeah, yeah, I'll do so. All right, that would be great. We'll, we'll definitely look into it because yeah. that's well, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to find people who are taking new approaches. What made me think about it, I don't know, Caller, if you heard the show that we had uh, a few weeks ago or, or a few months ago where we talked about the book Fringology uh, with Steve Volk, but that's what really started getting me thinking. That was that a good there, show. There needs to be new perspectives to what we're talking about. Oh, yeah, definitely. All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. All right, Thank have a you. Good night. And if you would like to call in, 508-996-0500, I know there's people out there that have more to say about this. Well, I'd also like to hear more about anybody that also had those uh, strange sightings up, up in the sky that they want to call in or if they want to share any uh, other paranormal experiences that they've had. We did. Uh, we got an email, which I'll share on the year. Uh, share on the air here. Uh, Christina sent this in. She just wanted to share her few UFO sightings she's had over the years. Her father would tell her a story when he was young and seeing a UFO looking up from the streets of East Boston back in the 40s to 50s. So since she was a kid, she'd watch the sky. Her first experience was so-so, around 1989-ish, as she had reflection scan across her wall of colors she had never seen in her life. She was terrified. Uh, she never did turn over to look at them more, but... What got her was the next day it was on the news about unidentified lights seen following Route 128, Route 3 from Waltham down to Braintree. Uh, her second experience was years later, around 1995 to 1996. Her mother and herself were driving north on 138 in Stoughton, and they both saw a greenish-blue light just fall out of the sky. 
uh, between where uh, between where they were and the Blue Hills. And the cloud cover that night was thick and just over the hill. The antenna light was in the clouds. The third was one night uh, sighting. It was one of two sightings at Scusset Beach. They were overnight fishing, third night in a row in early September 2003. They'd been drawn more to watching the stars and were watching this cluster of stars. At about 2 a.m., one of her friends and herself watched one of the stars uh, they were watching just fall down into the horizon. None of us were drinking that night, and it was definitely wasn't a satellite. And the fourth was also discussed about four years ago. Her friend and her were just watching the sky. Uh, both of them saw a light moving, and it looked like it could have been a bright satellite until it started squiggling, like as if you were signing your name, then just fly off with a lot of speed. The last one was two summers ago in Attleboro. Her and her friend were getting into the car, and for some reason she was drawn to the sky. She noticed the light, thought it might have been a plane, but there wasn't a flight path in that direction. The light went in and out of a cloud over and over, then it picked up speed and zigzagged before shooting off. Uh, the other person also saw it as well. So those are just some of the experiences that Christine has had over the years, and... Uh, very interesting stuff. Stuff that I'm sure Matt Moniz will want to take a read of that email a little bit more in depth later yeah, on. Yeah, it, it's classic stuff I've heard before, and I always like hearing local stuff. All right, well, let's go to the phones here. We have the VIP line ringing. So, good evening, you're on Spooky South Coast. Is this, is this the boss? Uh, well, if this is the VIP line, then I must be a VIP. This is Chris <laughs> from the Cape. <laughs> how are you doing, Chris from the other Cape? <laughs> how are you doing? All right. Chris. Morning. <laughs> I feel morning because I, you know, I got to take uh, my nap so I can catch my spooky South Coast. I'm staring next to the way past my bedtime nowadays. Well, when I said, "Is this the boss?" I actually meant my my boss, uh, Bob. Bob Unger, the uh, the editor of the Standard Times, might be calling in on this line. So you're you're blocking up the line from a very important person, Chris. Well, you know, <laughs> that's okay. Really, you're an okay. important person, so I'm uh, I'm sorry if I get you in trouble. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I just kind of wanted to. So it's a voice, kind of my opinion of what you guys are saying. Um, you know, and I think that uh, for those people who don't know, Tim and I have been working on a book, um, which is kind of <clears throat> looking at some classic cases and then kind of hearing some new stories from people. And I really honestly feel that it, it, it's been evidence that's killed the field. And I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me about that. No, um, you're right on the head. But as far as I'm concerned, evidence has gotten us no closer to understanding. Uh, it's done nothing but cloud the direction of people who could be asking some really intelligent questions if they weren't worried about, you know, what might be making their meter go off. And, and instead, we have a whole bunch of people going around becoming part of the story by what they're doing instead of trying to forward the story. Well, but uh, I mean, I understand where you're coming from with that. But also, do you think that negates the, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands of people who have maybe open their mind to the possibility of this stuff more from evidence that they've seen from somebody else? See, I don't think people people have opened their mind because of evidence. I think they've been given because of the popularity of shows um, and the spark of excitement of seeing evidence on television uh, in particular um, has given them the opportunity to talk about their experiences and mm -hmm. ask the questions. But I don't think it's given them inspiration at all. Um, I mean, I really do feel that the story is kind of what drives so many of these things, and it's what got people interested in it, and it's what got people um, to read those old books and to watch those old shows, most of which had absolutely nothing to do with going and finding the ghost yourself. And I, and I think that, you know, when people, hopefully there's a shift coming, um, and we see people going back to the story and retelling the stories, and... and, and um, hopefully when that happens, we can put all that equipment down. The equipment's great. I mean, it's, it's part of what should be the hobby um, of, of, of interacting with the paranormal, but I don't think it's, it's, the, it's the missing link we're looking for. Well, I ask you this then. How many people who are getting involved in this field then and going out and doing the investigation, doing the research, do you think that they were inspired more by seeing – hey, look at Jason and Grant. They're just two plumbers and they got a TV show. You know, I can get a TV show doing the same thing. It's not that hard to hunt for ghosts. Or do you think that they were inspired to get into this because of the evidence that they were seeing presented on the show? I do think that some of the evidence, when it first became in the the mainstream spotlight, when it first started to hit network cable television, I think that the evidence played a crucial role in what was going on because people sat up and took notice and said, not only is they it possible... They used it as the hook. 
that's what but, it was. It, but they were able to say, you know, that is something that I could probably go out and duplicate myself because I can get that same But all equipment. that evidence was in plenty of other books and stuff long before the shows were on. But, I'm, but what I'm saying is that the, the fact that people are out there trying to get evidence right now is inspiring other people to go out there and try and get evidence. Right. But where I agree with Chris is I think, in my opinion, we've already seen enough evidence to say there are anomalies happening. The 45,000 different ways of proving the anomaly is yeah. kind of over and done with. Is that, is that, is that kind of it? You know, the, the fact that we've said that these entities are there, this phenomena occurs, and we don't need to have yet another meter to prove that. Is that kind of what you're saying, Chris? Um, I think that I'm more concerned with the fact that if, <laughs> if you don't get the evidence, people feel that they haven't had an experience. Um, okay. And that people who who um, have had the few and far between experiences that they can't explain are the much more intriguing people to listen to. Um, but you know, I, I mean, I think that there's a place for all of that. I just don't think it's in the forefront <laughs> of what's going on, which is which is unfortunate. You know, and I've tried this year to bring in people who um, don't just have. Uh, evidence to present to us, that they have stories to present to us, and more importantly, that they have ideas. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding is those people are actually becoming, you know, fewer and far between. Really? Um, and that, that the, the majority of people who are contacting me are people who, um, let me tell you this one case, all this evidence I gathered from it, and, but, but no context for it, um, and no conclusion to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and it's odd because, you know, me, myself, I'm... I'm continuing to work on this case, and I've, I've brought some, some local people in Massachusetts in on it now, and I found myself being tainted by it, by thinking that the case needed to have some kind of conclusion before it was a story. Um, and what, what you need to realize is that the paranormal is part of a lot of people's everyday life, in one way or the other. Um, and to dismiss that, um, because the trend of the paranormal is now telling us that the the evidence and the visual is what's important, and what we can capture as opposed to what we can experience. Um, those kind of the, are the things that are that are disheartening when you're trying to present people that are interesting to an audience. You, you brought up a great point a few minutes ago when you talked about the stories that are lost because there's no verifiable evidence to prove them. Uh, right. There's no evidence to, there's no to picture, document There's them. no video. <clears throat> there's no EVPs. But yet the person's story could be quite significant. But because there's nothing accompanying with it that will gratify the other person's senses, it's ignored. But, uh, but is that what you're saying, Chris? Yeah. I mean, we um, Tim and I were approached by one of our listeners. Hopefully, he's listening tonight or listening to us on podcast, which he says he usually does. Named Ray J, who had a story of a haunted ring that his brother had purchased from eBay, and his initial contact with us was almost apologetic. Like, I don't think this is a good story. I'm, you know, I can't prove anything with, um, and and that's the perspective that a lot of people have. That if they can't, if, if if they, you know, are having these dreams which seem to be connected to reality, then they want to automatically dismiss it. And so it's kind of almost. Whereas for years it was people weren't listening because they thought this stuff was foolish. Now some people are not listening because it's not provable. And what's funny about that is for, you know, for a lot of people prior to this glut of paranormal media, there wasn't the need to prove it. When you had the story, you shared it. If it was profoundly effect, if it affected you profoundly mm -hmm. enough, you would share it anyway. And prior to, I'd say, you know, the late 1800s, when there started to be a scientific tearing apart of spiritualism, nobody needed any kind of proof to share these stories. There wasn't any way to scientifically prove them. The story right. was enough. And and now it's, yeah, now you're right. Now it's, it's, and it, it's I'm, not. I'm thinking even like uh, this year we had Willie Stewart on and, and I know we were all kind of like, wow, this is going to be awesome. And he talked about the book and so much of the chat discussion and so much of the discussion kind of with, with, um, with people that listen to South Coast, Spooky South Coast that I had afterwards was so based on the fact that well, come on, you can't prove that he saw this guy, and you can't see, and that no one could remember the message um, that this gentleman in the key had passed on to him, or this entity, or this being, whatever it was that, you know, we, now, the book wasn't that good, 
<laughs> that's, that's kind of irrelevant. The book was kind of horrible, uh, and the message wasn't all that interesting. But the, the fact of the matter was is that people were so consumed over whether or not um, he could have had this experience because he wasn't able to prove it, and there were so many holes in the story that no one really listened to the overall story that the guy was trying to tell. But the funny thing about that is, like you said, we were honored to have Whitley Strieber on our airwaves because of the profound impact that he had in, us in, in his, all of his previous works. And the book that put him on the map, of course, is completely unverifiable. Right. And the fact that he made his living as a fiction writer prior to that book makes it even less likely in my eyes that it's 100% truthful. But that was good enough for us 25 years ago when we read Communion to say, wow, here's a guy saying that this is a true story. That's fascinating yeah. to me. And now when he's basically telling us, you know, the the he's basically telling us the same story as Communion, only instead of trying to scare us, he's trying to inspire us. And now we're poo-pooing it and saying, ah, oh, no, I need more than that. It's funny because I remember being a, you know, probably 10-year-old um, and reading that book, 10, 12-year-old reading that book, and getting to the end where there's a little section of the of the um, uh, the lie detector test and his responses to it and stuff like that, and coming to the end and being like, well, yeah. I mean, there was no, oh, okay, so now it's true. Mm -hmm. um, it was much more of a, well, wow, well, it's good they were able to verify that. Um, you know, and I, and I wonder if there's a certain um, uh, suspension of, of disbelief that we've lost um, that I hope, you know, we can kind of regain. That, you know, it's not necessarily um, the whole story of the fact that we, you know, have gone this long without seeing the redhead hitchhiker, but rather that the, the stories and the, uh, and, and the tales of him continue to live on. And more importantly, people are continue to be inspired by them to go out and look for his ghost and the ghost of other things. Well, I think that there's, you know, there is kind of somewhat of a movement to uh, be able to express the story again without having the truth behind it. But what it is, is it's not the current stories that are causing that. It's all the new trend of going back. A, a guy like Dr. Bob Curran, who does a phenomenal job of going back and fighting historic cases of the existence of ghosts, vampires, you know, whatever it is that he happens to be writing about. And so in that regard, the story is enough. So why is it that we can take into account all these stories that happened in the past, but now if there is the existence of a digital camera, there is the existence of a cell phone camera, well, then there should have been one to record that. I'm going to take a step back and just let you have that moment because that was an amazing point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it, it's, I don't know, the, the more I look into, and we were, we were kind of talking a little bit about this as something that we're planning for a future show earlier today, but when you look back at some of the vintage ways that people investigated the paranormal, and when you look at some of the stories and the way that it was presented back then, I almost would rather have a newspaper print a story in a scoffing tone than to have... Uh, another newspaper story where a reporter follows a paranormal group into a supposedly haunted location and is blown away by some orb of dust that they got on a, on a camera. Right, and, I've, and I see so many of those that that's an automatic delete uh, button for me for, uh, for doing the Ghost Village News because I mean, that just makes like, <clears throat> it's very, it's very um, standard now. And so those people who are supposed to, you know, technically I guess be on the cutting edge of <laughs> presenting us with information um, yeah, it's not very good. And, and that's why uh, people send us emails and they don't understand why we say this, but that's why we don't feature groups on our show. We don't right. bring, you know, if you're Acme Paranormal Group, we don't want to have you come on and talk about what Acme, Acme Paranormal Group does in Acme, Iowa, and talk about some of the cases that you've had out there, unless you have a case that furthers the discussion of the paranormal, or you have a unique insight or a unique talent in the field that relates to a general overall discussion. So I, I feel bad because there's you know, hundreds of great, credible paranormal groups that should be spotlighted for the work that we do. But the way to advance the conversation isn't to just keep bringing on a parade of those investigators talking about their cases. It's to find what the overall story is behind it, to find what the overall conclusions can be made as a result of their work. And, and like no, you no. said, they don't, they don't, they're not looking for conclusions, they're just looking for, you know, results. 
you know, and I, I said this today when he asked me to be uh, one of the, the, the checkers for the um, for his, his you know his, his evidence uh, his evidence coalition that that, that he's formed. The peer review. Thank you very much. The peer review. Nobody can um, paranormal peer review. It flows off the tongue. What's the problem? I'm used to peer reviews in science. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm used to just being criticized by my peers, but. Um, <laughs> But one of the things I said to him was, you know, no one cares about your, your record collection. You know, it's very personal to you and it's very engaging to you. Um, but no one else really wants to sit down and see all the records you have. I guess in this day you have to see your downloads there. But you know, unless there's something in there that is truly revolutionary. Um, and that's kind of what you're saying. Like, you know, we need to further discussion as opposed to just ooing and eyeing over a picture. Well, I, I think... The problem is that people are, uh, the way the evidence is looked at, rather than it being looked at openly and objectively, people are, are uh, submitting it along with their personalities to go with it. Not saying that doesn't happen in science, but in actual peer review, a, lo a lot of studies are submitted in in a blind submission. In other words, you don't know who this came from and, and things like that, and it's objectively reviewed. Uh, and... You'd, that that would be the way to do it with this. Submit it without, you know, in a um, a, t a totally uh, anonymous way, it, but in a controlled manner, and then have the material reviewed. All right. Well, we are coming up on the end of the show, and Chris, you know, this is something that we can certainly talk about in a future episode. But next week we have Philip Copper coming on the show. Philip Copen. Copen. Oh, yeah. Philip Copen. With the uh, the ancient alien question. Well, that makes more sense now, because you sent me Philip Copper because you have autocorrect on your phone. <laughs> so there yeah. we go. All right, we'll try Philip. to deal with the new phone, so. Philip Copen. All right, so that's going to be a great show. So we'll be back to talk about that, and then, of course, we'll take our two-week holiday break, and then we'll be back with a fully stocked 2012. But that does it for this week's show. I want to thank everybody that called in and shared their opinions. Uh, again, if you had one of these UFO sightings, you can email us, SpookyCrew at SpookySouthCoast.com, and give us more details because I know Matt Moniz is going to want to put together a file of all those. But we will be back next week at the same time, 10 p.m., 10, 15 p.m., uh, to talk more about the paranormal. So until then, for Matt Costa, for Matt Moniz, for Chris Balzano, I'm Tim Weisberg, and we want you all to stay spooktacular. First with local news, talk, and sports. This is WBSM New Bedford, AM 1420, WBSM, a cumulus station. From ABC News. I'm Sharon Reed. It didn't take long for the verbal jabs to be thrown at the ABC News debate in Des Moines, Iowa. The focus of the five of the six candidates, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich. Taking the stage as the front runner, Newt Gingrich was the first to throw a punch against Mitt Romney, suggesting that Gingrich is a lifelong Washington insider. The only reason you didn't become a career politician is you lost to Teddy Kennedy in 1994. Well, that, that, wait a second. Romney that, wait was a second. prepared with this That's, response. This is the Teddy.